Welcome to Bert's Garage, a YouTube miniseries dedicated to building an exoset out of a fully functioning Mazda Miata. We're going to be pulling apart a 1999 NB and building one hell of an exoset. You guys better strap in and hold on. This is going to be one hell of a ride. And first to arrive is Bert, avid YouTuber and 3D printing enthusiast. He likes big guns and he likes to go fast. And the next member of our team to arrive is Doug, all around Miata expert and good guy to have on your side when you're working on a Miata because he's never wrong and he reminds you because he's never wrong. And last but not least to arrive is John, Miata expert, turbo expert, good all around mechanic and the guy you want to talk to about boost. You want to go fast, he's the guy to talk to, especially in a Miata. And now that you've met our team, it's time to get to work. First things first, we're gonna need tools and supplies. Here we have a bolt organizer, very, very important. It has four individual trays with several individual little pockets to put things. Make sure you label everything because if you don't label things, you're gonna have a bad day. Second, really big stuff up top or really awkward things like camber bolts and things that are too big to fit in those. Obviously you wanna individually bag them and keep them together or you're gonna have a bad day. Make sure you keep these in some sort of an order. That way, so when you start rebuilding, you can work your way backwards from where you started. Now let's move on to tools that we're going to need. We're going to need a master mechanic tool set here. We have the quarter inch, three eighths, and half inch drive. We're going to need sockets ranging from 27 millimeters all the way down to eight millimeters, I think is the smallest we need. All six point sockets, otherwise you're going to end up rounding bolts and that's going to be a really bad thing, as well as a large breaker bar. Then we're going to need screwdrivers from flathead and Phillips head screwdrivers all the way down to the smallest ones for those pesky trim pieces, an impact driver, impact bolt, universal joints, painter's tape, magnetic trays for your bolts, deep well sockets, needle nose pliers, dikes, a larger pair of dikes, and a flashlight. And now that we've... So we got our boy John here. He is currently unbolting the exhaust. So we unbolted the headers. The bolts came off with relatively little problem as we saw in the earlier video. Now he's taking off the lower O2 sensor, which is located right in there. Make sure you get the proper O2 uh, socket and John's gonna go ahead and take yeah, it that off. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier. Oh uh, yeah, it makes it a lot easier and you're not breaking stuff or your hands, which is, yeah. you know, relatively important. Now, we already pulled out the wiring harness that was in this area and we fed that back through the firewall. Now, this part here is all the fuel management system. A lot of this you can just leave attached to itself and just set it up on top of the block. It'll save you a lot of headache and heartache going forward. And there's some 10 and 12 millimeter bolts that are gonna hold that in place as well as just some little brackets. Um, that just unbolts. This is just part of your EVAP system, I take it? Uh, it's actually part of the fuel system. It's kind of like an expansion canister, and you'll see here some of the sensors associated with that. And then this all comes off of there's kind of the hard fuel lines that come up through over here and return back to the tank. And that's what all these guys attach to. So we're just hooking those or unhooking those for that matter and getting them out of the way so that way when we need to clear this stuff off the body, it'll be. Out of the way. Well, we are at the point that we are getting everything clean and free from the body, trying to get as much out of here as possible. So you can see up here towards the front, we've just pulled what's left of the wiring harness through the firewall. We've taken away the relay, uh, well not really the relay, but kind of the main large fuse box from up front here. Everything that was attached to the body, the power steering reservoir, all these types of things, we've disconnected all of them. You've pretty much got 10 millimeter bolts strewn about all over up here. And we're taking all these things and packing them in over the engine with the anticipation here that shortly we will be starting to get things unbolted from the body, like the subframes, things of that nature, dropping it clean and clear. So everything needs to be disconnected that interfaces between the engine and the firewall. And it's the same as we move towards the back of the vehicle. When we come back here, we had all the wiring harnesses that went back in through the trunk, things of that nature. They've all been taken out, clean and clear, and you can see that virtually there's nothing left here but the original shell of the body. Um, so we pulled all that stuff down through. Just be mindful of, you know, again, you're gonna have connectors on the wiring harness, you're gonna have different attachment points that you're gonna need to fish through different holes. It's gonna take patience, it's gonna be checking both sides, an extra set of hands will help. But if you're doing it by yourself, it's gonna be a lot of back and forth going through there. We also had one main connection and the reason we're back here is from the battery where that used to be, all of the terminal connections and everything that was back here, including the tail lights, those all pulled up through and they ended up going through a hole in the body to go down underneath of the car. And then you've got to attach, or actually for that matter, detach all the things along the PPF, the brace that runs down along through the body. And that ends up being this strewn hunk of wires 
that is now hanging under the car, clean and clear of everything so that way we can inevitably remove this body from the vehicle. And that wire harness that's down below actually is actually up what comes to you right here. Yep. So, uh, and because it goes back here into the trans tunnel and is sort of inaccessible to us right now, that's the reason why we're leaving that in place and this one down below, just so that way we can work with this a little easier later. So uh, we've pretty much finished the exhaust removal. And you can see here from the head that we've got things pretty well clean and clear. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of put some light in down here so we can see, but you can see down through here and uh, the secondary pipe down here is still on. We're getting the last of that off. You're gonna encounter a lot of rusted bolts down here. So you might find things that snap off. You might find things that just won't cooperate. Give them the patience, give them the penetrating oil work at them if you break off bolts if you don't plan on reusing them if you need to cut them off if whatever you got to do just work with it this stuff is going to be challenging it's a used car it's seen a lot of years it's seen a lot of winters especially up north here so you're going to have some trouble with the exhaust just bear with it and work through it you'll get it all off we're just cutting the exhaust hangers off to save ourselves headache and time these are things we don't plan to reuse and they really have no value so we're just going through that, but that's gonna get everything pretty much clean and clear here. And then we're gonna be back on the road and ready to get this thing rolling. Woohoo! Also, one thing that's worth mentioning, uh, let's explain to them about the engine mounts. So, okay, what we've got here, and you can see this guy is the driver's side motor mount. And you can see this little rubber bushing down in here marked N. Uh, this is the stock Mazda motor mount. You'll find the same exact mount on both sides of the car. And these are notoriously known for being absolutely obliterated. And you can see here that you can pretty much lock this engine by hand even as it sits. And just think about that magnified with the amount of torque that the engine can make. And that's a naturally aspirated engine. You throw a turbocharger or a supercharger on here, those things are just going to get torqued all to hell. You're going to need different style mounts to really hold together the power that you want to put into something like this and that's going to come with increased vibrations but at the same time you're not going to have like let's say here in our case it'd be a turbo downpipe slamming into body work the engine jumping all over the place not something that you want so you want to either get the mazda competition mounts and you'll get one for each side or you can always go with the awrs which are very stiff you're going to get a lot more vibration but it's going to keep that thing planted right where it needs to be all right so we've removed the front header the exhaust header now we want to drop the entire exhaust. Now we are going to take the exhaust apart. We're going to take it down to one full piece. And the O2 sensor is still attached up front. So in order to get this thing down, we're going to drop the rear subframe support, I guess is what this is. And these are just a couple 17 millimeters. So you're going to want to get a breaker bar because these sit have been... That just sheared off. That just sheared off. Damn it. Oh well, you know what? We don't need that. All right, so right now we're just bleeding the brakes. Well, actually draining everything, so we have them disconnected. Uh, coffee cans just catching the fluid down here. Brake fluid eats through paint, so you're gonna make sure you're not touching paint after you get it on your hands or anything. And uh, basically just, yeah, letting it drain for now. Uh, Cause we're gonna reuse a lot of the braking system. And then after that, obviously we unhook the brake lines from the master cylinder, and a lot of that stuff can just go along with the body, and then we can take it off later. Well, they're actually, they're, they're entirely attached to the body. They don't even need removed from the master cylinder at this point in time. Maybe later, we may need to remove them if we're going to reuse any of the configuration of lines as they are now. Um, but that's if we don't go custom lines out from the master cylinder based on where they're going to route. But as long as they're disconnected from the brake calipers, they're attached to the body the rest of the way through, and they can come off as we haul everything off of there. Yeah. You ever happen to hear this? that kind of a noise it's not a bad noise but it scared the shit out of us yeah. okay so while the brakes are draining john and i are going to go ahead and we're going to remove the front sway bar that's this guy right here and it's actually attached to the body so you've just got uh, a couple 12 yeah four 12 millimeter bolts and all we have to do is remove it from the body we're and not that's actually it. taking it off the suspension here no so just take those off and it'll come on down and then you're good to go for your next part of disassembly which we're not really sure what that is yet so we are wrapping up at the end of technically day three now we've really only put about what 25 man hours into this car at this maybe. point maybe 25 man hours oh, at wow. most and we really don't know what we're doing and we're also videotaping everything which takes a lot more time and this is how far we've gotten 
We've got the whole entire engine wiring bay pulled out. AC has been deleted, radiator's gone. The only thing left that's really attached to the body is the steering column, and that's pretty much it for that. We go around, we've got the entire front taken off, brake lines are bled, wiring is all taken out of there. The interior here, completely stripped. I have to say, Mazda, you did, they did a hell of a job building this thing to make it easy to take make apart. Make it very easy. Yeah. Make it very easy. So, interior is a joke. there's, we didn't detail absolutely everything just because there's no point detailing everything if, no offense, if you're a complete idiot, you probably shouldn't undertake this. I'm just saying. If you can't figure out what we've done in between the clips, you probably shouldn't have underdone, tried this in the first place. So, now we're going to go to the back here, now that I've insulted probably a couple of our viewers. We've obviously pulled, you know, all the brake lines and stuff out from down there. And obviously you have to unhook the brake line, the e-brake, and all that other stuff whenever you d disassemble the chassis because otherwise they're going to come and they're going to try and tear each other apart. And then we've got the back of the car here. So all we've really got to do at this point is unattach the entire gas main assembly here. Um, obviously there's about three quarters of a tank in this, so that's going to be a little heavy. Why well, unhook the um, coilovers for this thing and the coilovers that we have in this, are they pretty well disintegrated, do you think? Uh, yeah, the shock mounts are, we know that much. They're sure, they're absolutely, they, they literally came out in like... Chunks, pieces, flakes. It was, it was bad, it was bad, it was bad. So we're going to get a nice set of skunks and we're going to fix that. But yeah, I have to say, this is exceedingly easier than we ever thought it was going to be. Yeah, it, you like, can we, just look at it and figure it out. You right? can look at it and figure it out. It's not hard, guys. This is not rocket science. I feel kind of like a dumbass for waiting so many years and being so intimidated to build this. And mind you, we're not in a giant garage. We've got a whole bunch of our spare stuff up there in storage that we're going to keep and, you know, just other stuff that we need. But, like, down here is the wiring harness. That took us a decent portion of the day just because you have to be cable, ca cable, cable, <laughs> You have to be careful. You have to label everything. That shit takes time. But, yeah, it has been an unbelievably uh, easy teardown. And the exhaust did give us a little bit of trouble with some of the rust and that. But all in all, it wasn't terribly ter It wasn't bad. And, you know, we've got a whole bunch of pieces here for the body. One thing I have to say is whenever you pull off the dash, drive by the driver's side, front left, you're going to have a little plate that's going to have your VIN number on it. If you don't pull that off, you are totally and utterly because you cannot get your uh, modified class title otherwise. You have to grab that. Also, it wouldn't hurt to take a picture, mind you, of the VIN number that is right here on the actual body underneath all this crap. There's actually the VIN number right here. Take a picture of that, cut that off, whatever you want to do. Keep it if you can because it can't hurt. And we believe there's also a VIN number somewhere on the block as well, possibly. Yeah, there's too much grime. We there's too much grime, grime, and we're not totally sure of that, so we we'll may have to look on the forms. Um, but yeah, the Exoset is looking like it's going to be an incredibly easy build. They say it'll take about 100 hours to build one from beginning to end, and we're really kind of getting that idea that it probably is. Yeah. We were expecting to have this done by, like, February, and now we're looking like it's going to be done by, like, the end of, like, October. We'll be waiting At on the chassis. Well, yeah, the chassis is supposed to show up at what? End of September. So I figure we expected to have this done by the end of September. It is what, August 5th? Yeah. So we're way ahead of schedule, which means we're going to have to find uh, something else to do. Probably go to races and blow shit up. I mean, that's that's what everything, that's that's all I know how to do. So, yeah. Um. Other than that, next part, obviously, is a strip of bike. Strip of Next part is obviously we're going to strip everything else out of here. We're going to pull the tub off. We've got the entire chassis that will then pull out. We'll send it to powder coating. And then, you know, we'll have to wait about two, three weeks on that one. And hopefully the kit gets here pretty soon. But we'll just have to wait and see. All right, so now we're back at it. Uh, right now we're worrying about the parking brake cables. We're going to go underneath, unbolt everything for that, make sure subframe and body can come apart. Uh, same with up at the front, we have the master cylinder for the brake, brake booster, and the clutch master all disconnected up here. And down here we're going to have to disconnect the slave cylinder for the clutch. And that's going to be two 12 millimeter bolts and then also a 10 millimeter for the line. And we have the hose for the booster already disconnected from the intake manifold.
Doug, you want to run us through what we got going on in this so, contraption here? Yep, aside from that here, we have our engine hoist crane going on here, ready to pull the body off once we've got everything unbolted. You can see here, essentially, we have anchored four uh, points with the chains. Two of those, we've used a large chain down to the, what was the seat belt, or not the seat belt, but actually the seats themselves. Uh, two 15 millimeter bolts, the original ones from there. And we were gonna try and use some anchor points down over here, like the lower seat belt point, things like that. We didn't find anything that we felt safe with. So we've gone back and we've hooked it down through the upper anchors for the seat belts. And this is not a heavy load bearing chain. So with precautions here, we've also attached a heavy ratchet strap the whole way around the body. And we've linked that up to the chain just in case any of these fail or anything happens. We've got something to catch and hold on. That way we're not uh, dropping anything on our feet or anyone. So safety first, we're gonna pull this body off but we're gonna make sure that no bodies end up underneath it. I was looking through the project. Obviously we want to do a turbo. If we do a turbo, with the exhaust, clutch, and everything from flying me out, it's like 6,500. Or we can build another one if we don't turbocharge this, which does mean that we then need to get another exhaust because I just sold it. Well, also true. I mean, you were going to want a different exhaust regardless. Yeah, brilliant. Now, a naturally aspirated or supercharged exhaust. Now, there's another option too. What, is yeah, turbo the final answer or is supercharger an option? Well, they don't make the Jackson turbs. No, but you can find them on the used market fairly often in a full kit that way. To about two grand. Under that. Yeah, I've seen them for about 1800 You're 1300 to 2000 depending on how complete and how low mileage the kit. So, I mean, you're in the options of you could build essentially two of this. You could build one turbocharged one and go for a lot of horsepower, mm -hmm. or you could kind of go for the mid-range, do a decent bit of power, have the supercharger. It's going to be a little bit more. You're still going to need the clutch, but you go the naturally aspirated exhaust route. You've got a little bit more room there, but you've got the supercharged engine, which you can get into essentially the flying me on a voodoo box mm -hmm. for the fueling solution and otherwise pretty much stuck. What do you think? Honda K series. Oh fuck! Uh, well, we're gonna do. Yeah, we're already gonna talk K swap. I mean, I'm I'm not even talking swaps at this point. So I mean, a second exo exoset would be absolutely awesome yeah. and cool. First off, we'd have to source another donor. Well, and what him and I were talking about is, once we get this down, obviously we're not gonna really forget how to fucking do this ever. True. Ever. Yeah. We could reasonably we could just rent out a large storage unit and do this if we got everything ahead of time. Now you're back into talking about more costs. Storage unit, I figure, is a sunk cost of like three to four hundred bucks. True. For like two months, but you figure if we got we we got everything ordered, we got the body pulled apart, the kit shows up, and we obviously would be working on a bit of a more compact time frame. But we could build another one of these and not even have to use like a common house. We could not not have to use here. We could use some place with a lot more space. So we we could have the second one yet again. But now, what are you going to do with the second one? I don't know. That's the problem. What's you know, the main goal with the first one? Want go fast! fast go fast! Or? We want to go fast! So, I mean, if you're we're absolutely batshit nuts about going fast, I mean, you're uh, going actually, to need, I, you're gonna need the power to weight ratio. The thing you've been talking about since the beginning is the power to weight ratio. Yeah, so, my, so, to then get this far I don't and want, then settle for a naturally aspirated exoset build, all you're gonna do is continually kick yourself and go, but I could have a second. Oh, am I gonna spend another 6,500 on the second for when I inevitably want to turbo that one? Yeah. If so, then what the hell was the point? Well, and here's the thing. You're gonna buy what a if turbo we, before you buy a second. What if we take this to like bagels and co or cars Cars and coffee. coffee, yeah. And some guy comes up and says, I'll give you 35 grand for that. It's not gonna happen. Cars awesome. and coffee, those kids aren't even patronizing the businesses. They're not. <laughs> they do not have dollars to their names. Oh, I figured they'd probably spent their entire rent money on, you know, the, the sport <laughs> of Rent money? Those kids live with their parents. I know they live with their parents. I'm just There's saying, no rent. What if we go to something and someone does offer to buy it? Then obviously we've got a very big... You're very talking bigger in car show. You're talking mid-summer, late next season. Yeah. And that's if the stars align, the planets all do some form of Jupiter dance, yeah. and you end up in the right place at the right time with someone who has money and no brains that could realize that they could do it themselves with a set of hand tools... And two idiots willing to come out and help them. Well, uh, two idiots and a complete jackass. Right. So the two <laughs> idiots willing to come out and help. Turbo. 
I turbo. There's fucking. If somebody sees the turbo one, they might offer you more anyways. Also true. Well, no, but here's the thing. But supercharger wine is it's cool. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> I mean, it does. But how loud is the turbo going to be with just nothing around you? Now, the blow off valve. Do that around, no, blow off valve is fucking ridiculous. Listen, in one of these. blow off valve is cool. It's got to be HKS SSQV, and the reason <laughs> why, because I mean, it pretty much makes my panties drop. It's fantastic. Um, but also for the viewers who don't know what that means, what do you mean? HAS. No, the HKS brand uh, SSQB super sequential. Oh, okay, super okay. Okay. HKS SSQB like and only the legit ones, not the stupid knockoff nonsense. And the reason I like them so much is instead of a push style blow off valve. Mm -hmm. So traditional blow off valves are essentially a piston that's held by equilibrium pressure on both sides by both in the boost tube and in a line that inevitably goes to the back side of it and keeps it down. So what you've got is you've got your boost pressure running underneath the piston and constantly against it down here. There's a spring that monitors the tension. Well, the there's the spring that monitors that tension that essentially applies the additional tension and then once that... It hits 6, 10, 12 PSI. No, 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 no. You're thinking wastegate. Uh, I'm thinking, I am thinking wastegate. Blow-off valve is what you're preventing all your pressure from backing against the throttle plate or surging back into the compressor. That is your charge pipes between the turbocharger and the Prevents overcharging and blowing up, blowing your engine apart. Yes, or worse yet, basically what ends up happening is it usually escapes the only route it can go, which is back through the compressor, which means that the compressor wheel that was spinning this way at 50,000 RPMs now, now has to stop and go the other direction. You got that weird... Whoa, 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 yeah, compressor surge. Yeah, so, I mean, that absolutely <laughs> sucks. Bad yeah, things, sound very great. bad things, <laughs> goodbye bearings. Have you ever seen the Top Gear episode where Hammond was driving the Noble... Clarkson was driving. Yeah, the, the twin turbo V6 where he's constantly hitting and you the hear that. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Like, so that's, I mean, that's a recirculating system. And so what that is, is that it takes. My, my Audi had that. I know. Yeah, and all that does is that recirculates the boost tube back into the intake track, makes a lot less noise, makes kind of that unique sound where it's much more muffled. Mm -hmm. Now, I like our setup, actually. the I part that sounds amazing about turbo builds is when the wastegate cracks. Because when you essentially then have the compressor bypass of the exhaust flow and that son of a bitch cracks, you get many, many noises out of the exhaust pipe. <laughs> and if it's externally wastegated, like, I don't know, a dump tube, which may or may not be legal, um, but nobody really the checks. The solenoid dump tube is what you're talking about, or the selector one where you can... No, 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 no. Like, literally what you have is you have your downpipe that comes off of the turbo, and usually you either have to have a divorced setup where you have basically your wastegate and your turbo both back to separate tubes which then come and merge together and go out the tailpipe, which is what you're supposed to do. Or you basically have just the, that was nice, um, you have the downpipe coming We'll edit that out. No, you won't. <laughs> you have the downpipe coming off of the turbo and then you have your wastegate over here. Well, you just basically, instead of merging that pipe back onto the exhaust, it just goes boop. Straight down. Yeah. And it's just an open dump when the wastegate cracks. So what happens is basically you get on that throttle and you get your <laughs> and it just does that as soon as the wastegate cracks. Fantastic noises, and especially with a big open car like that, it may actually be too much. It may. And there's a lot for me to say that that may be too much, but it could be. I just don't want to get pulled over by the local soccer mom cop guy. Uh, let's remember you're going to be driving essentially an open wheel kit car. If you're worried about getting pulled over, you had the wrong. I had the wrong. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's like saying, oh, buying a Ferrari. Oh, God, the gas must be expensive. You don't even need to. Oh, I bought a Ferrari, and I can't believe people pay attention to me. Whether it be cop or stupid ass kid in Honda. I drive a Honda. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, point taken. All right, so we have to. Do that All right, so okay. ultimately, ultimately, it sounds like you're still turbo, 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 turbo. turbo. All right, you know, what? we'll build one. We'll build it great, and then we'll wait like a year when I've saved up enough, and then we can build another. Oh, right. We can so, build John one. Well, so we John can, can save up, and we can build it. We get through the first one. Well, we do see how fast it is. Right. You're gonna want one. We yeah. get through the first one, we get through the turbo stuff, we get through ironing out the kinks and the tuning, and we get through so Alright, anyway, so we're gonna have to do turbo. We get through the first yeah. one, we go through the turbo, we iron the kinks, we decide what we do and we don't like about it, and then we have our opportunity to say, okay, next time we will, next Case time swap. we won't. Case swap. You know, and basically at that point in Case time, swap. my recommendation That's what I want. is two whiteboards. Pros and cons. All the things oh. that I like about it. 
all the things I don't like Speaking about. Speaking of which, I get two nice. big whiteboards, and I want to put on one like done and to do. That way, so people can kind of oh, see. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. no, without a doubt. But I think you should also have another one that basically you start listing all the things: what you do like, what you don't like, what you would change given the opportunity, and then essentially what you've got is you basically got your dream list for your second build. I'd like to build the dream the first time, or what we don't like about the first one, do that in the second. Well, right, that's yeah. exactly what I'm yeah. saying. So, so do that. So I think it sounds like this is going to be a turbo. Yeah, it's going to be a turbo. Right. Okay. We've settled that. Time okay. to move on. Awesome. If you like Pixel Armory and the content we make, feel free to become a Patreon subscriber and support us just like our good friend Patrick.